morning how good it is for brothers and sisters to come together and dwell in the place of unity. We come together to give God glory and praise in this moment. We are thankful for all that the Lord has done and we cherish this opportunity to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. God is worthy of all of our praise and in this Sunday in which we celebrate our heritage and what God has done, we can declare the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all of us shall see it together. Can you rejoice with me in this moment and celebrate and declare that this is the day that the Lord has made and we have come to rejoice and be glad in it. We are glad to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us look to the Lord in a word of prayer as we share in this moment. Gracious God, how we adore you. Gracious God, how we come into this place, give you thanks, honor, and glory for all that you have done. We come, God, receiving your spirit, and we come, God, giving you our best offering of worship in this moment. Bless, God, this choir that will continue to inspire us, continue to bless this preacher. Bless, God, this worship atmosphere that we might come together just to give you glory, just to give you honor, just to look back over our lives and thank you for what you've done. But not only that, God, but to look back and see how far we've come as a people to celebrate what you've done in us and our story today. So bless us, God, and continue to keep us as we go forward in the wonderful, marvelous, and majestic name of Jesus, the people of God together. Say amen, say amen, and say amen. Let us receive our musical aggregation as they come and lead us in worship and in song.
if I ask the question, what, if I ask the question, what is he to you? Hey, man, what be the response? If I ask the question, what is he to you? The, the saints say he's a heavy load sharer and, and a burden bearer. They, the elders say he's a way maker. He, he's a provider. What, what is he to you? If I was to ask what, what is he to you, what would be your response on this morning? That's Whatever he is, that's, that's what he is. I, I believe they say he puts a roof over my head and food on my table and clothes on my back. That he makes ways out of no way. That he still shows up in the middle of the dark. That's, that's just what he is. He's what he is and we're grateful. We are grateful. Hallelujah. Grateful for this wonderful musical aggregation for blessing us on tonight. Amen. Grateful, grateful, grateful. Listen. We take this time simply to greet you and declare the goodness of the Lord is in this place. We celebrate and we celebrate and acknowledge the, the spirit of worship in this place. We recognize the great energy, the spirit of the ancestors that just continues to pour in and feed us in this moment. We greet you in the Zulu word, Sabubona, sab Sabubona, 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 which simply means we see you. Sawubona means we see you. We recognize your presence. We acknowledge who you are. We, your presence has value to us. Sawubona. And the response is Yebo Sawubona. Yes, we see you. We see you in this place. It is the essence of fellowship. It is the essence of coming together. It is the, it is the symbol and the meaning of what it means to gather together in unity. Everybody is included. Everybody is recognized under the idea of we see you, there is value in you being in this place. So, Sawabona, we see you, we greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is good to be in the house of the Lord on this morning. Amen. We are grateful. We are blessed to share in this moment. I want to share in just a few announcements. Listen, we have a preacher that is able uh, to uh, this morning, and so we want to recognize uh, him quickly and just celebrate in this moment. Grateful for him even traveling and coming this way to share with us, but I have some announcements that as we share in this moment, uh, Reverend Dr. Greg Howard uh, is here celebrating with us for our Sankofa Sunday. Amen. Amen. And we are grateful for his presence. We just want to give you some information that you will see that the FAM, F-A-M, our uh, family advocacy ministry is gathering and meeting on March 1st. They will do that on, via Zoom March 1st uh, at 7 p.m. They are preparing to launch their community-wide touchless drive-through food pantry. They're going to provide a, a food pantry that is going to be drive-through and touchless. And so if you are interested in sharing in that process and working together to be a part of that, please get in contact with the church uh, so that you can get the information. I'm going to give it to you quickly now. The meeting ID is 856-1025-0794. I'm going to do that again. 856-1025-0794. And the passcode for that are capitals NCBCFAM, NCBCFAM. And so please make sure if you are interested in sharing in the family advocacy ministry that you sign on to that. We also continue to celebrate and acknowledge our church school. We are grateful for all of you who have signed up and who share in our virtual church school. It is taking place uh, every Sunday morning from 9 to 10, from 9 to 10. So this morning uh, we had our virtual school, grateful for those teachers. And so if you are interested in sharing, please call the church office by 2 p.m. 
on a Friday so that we can have you registered and signed up for that uh, and give you the information to sign on to our church school. Also want to just acknowledge and uh, those who are becoming uh, members of the New Calvary family. We are delighted that we are having members who are joining and being a part of New Calvary virtually. Amen. They are becoming a part of the New Calvary family virtually and we do not take that for granted. We're grateful for that. And so if you are indeed desiring to be a part of the New Calvary family, not only can you put it in the comments section uh, uh, in on social media, but you can also call uh, we a specific number for our new members. That is 757-828-6162. It'll be posted on your screen. 757-828-6121. So you can uh, sign on to that uh, and give a call and uh, there will be somebody who will receive you, somebody who will get your information and make sure that the proper steps are taken that you can share and be a member of the New Calvary Baptist Church family. You can also email us at newcav, N-E-W-C-A-V, newcav1 at verizon.net. And you can also call the church, 757 627 Two six nine for sharing uh, any membership that you would so desire. And we are grateful and excited as God continues to increase this vineyard as we continue to stretch our possibilities uh, and the opportunities for ministry in this place. We want to continue to thank you all for your giving uh, as we continue to understand that this work cannot be done without you, without your gifts and without your ability as we understand it is our assignment to bring all of our tithes and offerings into the storehouse even virtually. And so you can make that happen by coming to 800 East Virginia Beach Boulevard here in the city of Norfolk, 23504. Or you can mail those to that address. Or, or you can get on Givelify and make New Calvary your favorite place to give. However you give, we understand that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And we thank faithfulness and uh, that continue to pour in to the New Calvary family as we do the work of ministry in this place. Please do not forget, tell your family, tell your friends to like and subscribe to New Calvary Baptist Church, New Calvary uh, Norfolk VA. That is on Facebook, that is uh, on YouTube, and you can get on Instagram, find us and share with us as well. And please uh, keep in contact with us as we continue to do the work of ministry in this place. I am grateful for all of those who continue to share and as we expand we had a wonderful time. I'm told the women had an awesome time this past weekend as they continued to share uh, in their women's ministry as uh, Minister Brittany Lyons continued to bless and talk about the importance of self-care and so we appreciate uh, the gifts of New Calvary even coming home to be a blessing to us and we continue to move forward and to share in the gifts of ministry. And this um, month that's uh, coming up in March is Women's Month. And there I am told there are a whole lot of things that they have in store that they are excited to share in the month of March. And so we are going to be excited to share and experience with them and hope and pray as we labor together. We also please note that the hours of New Calvary, our business hours we have, do have these COVID hours. And so uh, from 9 to 2, uh, from Tuesday on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. From Tuesday to Friday, from 9 to 2. From 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., uh, all business, you can make your calls, and all business is conducted in those hours. And so thank you in advance for your faithfulness and all that you do. Uh, we're going to take this time and this moment uh, to share in a word of prayer because there are those uh, who need prayer in uh, New Calvary Baptist Church family, but I'm just going to take this time to share and introduce uh, this preacher of the hour who is coming to bless us on today. It is indeed a treat to have him. He serves uh, as the interim dean of the School of Theology of Virginia Union University. He is a brother beloved. He is a friend. He is a fraternity brother, so you know he's a good dude all around. He is a deep, uh, comes in the form of the Reverend Dr. Gregory Howard. 
and he is the pastor of Union Branch Baptist Church in Chesterfield, Virginia. He continues to move and work uh, faithfully in the kingdom of God. He is a brother who's not afraid to work hard and to invest in people and to invest in the liberation of his people. He holds a bachelor's of science degree from or uh, in organizational management and development from Bluefield State College. He holds a master of divinity from the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union University and a doctor of ministry degree with a concentration in preaching in Aquinas Institute of Theology at St. Louis University. He is the author of Black Sacred Rhetoric, the Gospel According to Religious Folk Talk and Voices Crying Out in the Wilderness, Theological Reflections Where Context Matters. He is a preaching professor at the School of Theology and I am grateful to him uh, in our friendship and our brotherhood as he has allowed me to be an adjunct professor at the School of Theology and I have shared there uh, under his leadership and I am grateful for his leadership and his trust in me. It has been an awesome, awesome journey. And so he is an outstanding preacher of the gospel uh, and we will be blessed on this Sankofa Sunday. So after we go to the Lord in prayer and after we hear from this wonderful choir blessing us, we will hear from the Reverend Dr. Gregory Howard. And so we prepare our hearts and minds uh, to share uh, in a word of prayer. Like we said, there is so much going on right now in the family of faith, so much going on in the New Calvary family, and we want to lift up prayer because we understand with much prayer, there is much power. With little prayer, there's little power. And with no prayer, there's no power. And so we continue to pray for one another. We continue to pray uh, for all of the saints. We continue to pray uh, for the power to continue just to run on a little while longer. And so if there are prayer concerns that you have at this particular moment, we invite you to put them in the comment section uh, of your a screen and so that our virtual minister may acknowledge and recognize and continue to lift up your needs and concerns in a word of prayer. But we pray uh, for the new, as the New Calvary family and as a body of believers, we pray for Sister Brenda Morris, we pray uh, for Sister Leonthea Miller, we pray for Sister Patricia Ganey, we pray for Sister Emma Tyree, we pray for Sister LaBarbara Willis who had to go to the hospital this week and we pray for her recovery, we we pray for Sister Darlene and Brother Wayne Baxter. We pray for the Turner family, Sister Dolores and Brother Joe Turner. We pray for the Little, Sister Willie May and Brother George Little, who is now uh, in the hospital. We pray for Brother Willie Turner. Pray for Brother Harold Brown, who is recuperating from heart surgery. Glory to God. We are grateful. We pray for Sister Cynthia Hannah, and we pray for the Allen family. And we pray uh, for the passing and the home going of Sister Layla Banks. Sister Layla Banks went home to be with the Lord. She is and the family. Uh, we pray for, she is the cousin of Brother William Dell, a former trustee here. And so we continue to just pray as our list continues to grow. We do believe that our faith grows stronger and God will continue to surround us with power uh, in this place. So let us look to the Lord in a word of prayer as we invoke the Lord's presence. For God, how grateful we are. How grateful we are for another day. How grateful we are for the opportunity just to worship you in spirit and in truth. We're grateful, dear God, for all that you have done. Grateful for the ways that you've made. Grateful for how you provide. We thank you, God, for this day that you've allowed us to wake up as you have touched us with your finger of love, as you have blessed us, God, to understand that we must make our way to a place of worship, to recognize, to connect, and to fellowship, and to give you praise, honor, and glory for one more time. God, we thank you for this Sankofa Sunday. Thank you for the opportunity to celebrate, to worship you, and to honor and to remember those who have gone before us. Help us, God, to touch and remember the legacy of those ancestors who have touched us and made a difference in our lives and a difference in our journey. But most of all, help us to be reminded, God, of the faithfulness that they walked with, of the trust of that they walked with, that the, the faith continued to move forward, believing, God, that you 
bring them this far to leave them. That God, we would continue to just declare the goodness of the Lord and all that has taken place and all that has been done. God, we take this moment to share with one another and pray, God, for this nation. We pray, God, for a nation that needs to be healed. We pray, God, for a nation that is incredibly divided. We pray, God, for leaders that seem to find it difficult to find their way in between maintaining their power and understanding their purpose. But God, we still believe that those who can proclaim your name and those who believe in a resurrected Savior, those who believe in a Palestinian and Jew from Nazareth still declare that power is in the Lord's hands. So God, have your way in this place. Continue to inspire us. Continue to lead us, God, that we might be led to declare um, that what God the dust says the Lord and we still believe that there is power in the resurrected name of Jesus. So God, have your way. Touch this preacher in a mighty way. Lead him, guide him, direct him as only you can. Strengthen him, God, and continue to lead him to have a word for your people. God bless those who are watching and sharing and participating on this morning. God continue to lead them that God whatever it is they might need whatever it is the situation they find themselves in whatever they're struggling with God that you and you alone might be the source of their strength and their redemption God that they might remember that they are still your children and whatever it is they're facing God whatever it is that is a Above their head, it is still beneath your feet. So God, strengthen us to continue to move forward. And in all things, we give you glory, honor, and praise. We remember, God, that you still make rough places straight. You still make crooked places straight. You still work words and make it out of no way. And God, we give you glory on this morning. We thank you this morning for the ways that you've made. And we're asking that you would just continue to keep us and lift us up in the wonderful marvelous, majestic, miracle-working name of Jesus and everything that has breath might understand and declare that where two or three are gathered in the place that you are in the midst and that we declare that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that the Lord still reigns. So have your way and we give you thanks in the wonderful, marvelous name of Jesus that the people of God together Together would say amen, amen, and amen. Come on, put your lights up, put your hands up as we receive this choir for blessing us, as we prepare our hearts and minds for the preached word of God.
in this song that our worship is for real in the midst of alternative facts and falsehoods our worship is for real therefore we declare as David did that I will bless the Lord at all times his praise shall continually be upon my lips my soul shall make boast of the Lord so much so that the humble and the afflicted shall hear thereof and be made glad he says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. I can do it by myself, but the psalmist declared, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let all of us who can acknowledge that we've been saved and set free, kept by a loving God, let all of us say so. And giving God the highest praise of hallelujah and glory to your name. God, we thank you. We didn't have to do it. I hear the season saints whispering still, but you did. God, we thank you. And again, therefore, our worship is authentic. It's, it's for real. Well, good morning, and God bless each and every one of you all on this, the Lord's Day. I am happy glad i am grateful unto god to be here in this sacred setting sharing space with my sisters and my brothers my beloved friend your pastor dr small we thank god for him the ministerial staff his lovely bride and family every faithful servant here at new calvary and in our neighboring communities of faith for this band brother moody and the rest of the gang and all of those who angelic uh, voices uh, temple worshipers and singers God bless you all for ministering unto me on this the Lord's day uh, we take it not for granted the few of us that are privileged to gather in the midst of uh, this uh, current season of COVID-19 uh, because we have discovered the richness and such fellowship uh, so thank you, thank you once again for the invitation as I'm honored and humbled uh, to serve uh, as preacher on this day, uh, San Kofa Sunday, uh, and this month, and for that matter, every single day in which we honor and celebrate our blessed heritage. I trust that everyone is feeling blessed. Uh, I won't be before you. Uh, with much preliminaries, I've stated and shared with you uh, from my heart, my appreciation to be standing here before you and also my um, sincere love um, for my brother beloved, uh, Dr. Small. God bless you. God bless you, Marcus. God bless you. <clears throat> the word of God's uh, point of departure is found in the gospel according to Luke, the fourth chapter, uh, verses uh, 14 through 21. The gospel according to Luke, the 14th chapter, verses of the fourth chapter, verses 14 through 21. And it reads as stated in the text, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me or upon me. 
because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The grass still withers and the flowers still fade. But thanks be to God that the word of God likewise still lasts forever. And we trust that the Lord will help us through this text and the thought on this Sankofa summer, Sunday, uh, which I present to you now, the miseducation of the Negro church. Sankofa is salvation. Sankofa is salvation. Eternal and gracious God, we thank you. We lift you up. We extol and exalt your wonderful and your marvelous name. From beginning to end, we have discovered day by day that you are faithful, and therefore, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, we choose to render you praise. Thank you, God, for keeping us. Thank you for enlightening us and empowering us. But even in our weakness and even in our most fragile state, God, you were there as that prop on each and every leaning side. So God, have your way now as you continue to reveal unto us how you are in our midst, even by way, and through this, your living body of Christ. Bless now not only the preacher, but the hearer, and bless the preacher as hearer. For God, if you can speak through a burning bush, and you can cause a donkey or mule to utter words in the trees of Lebanon to render you praise, certainly you can use this earthen vessel. God, this is my humble prayer, and I ask it all in the wonderful and marvelous name of he who died, but still lives, because he got up early one Sunday morning. It is in the name of Mary's baby, Jesus the Christ, we say, amen. The miseducation of Negro Church, Sankofa, is salvation. You've heard it in recent days as perhaps all your life the name Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Well, back in 1933, the architect of Black History Week, now Black History Month, published his seminal work, The Miseducation of the Negro. His overall thesis was that within American schools, blacks during his day were being culturally indoctrinated rather than taught to think critically with their own stories as references and points of departure. This conditioning, he claimed, caused blacks to become dependent upon the majority, as well as enticed to seek out inferior places in the greater society. In other words, black students were being made to advance America, but not themselves made to chase after the so-called American dream at the cost of leaving their heritage, their communities, and even themselves behind. It is my contention, my beloved, that such a proposition and a position by Carter is also the precipice that paralyzes, unfortunately, both the pew and the pulpit in many of our once prophetic black churches. Quite simply stated, we have become culturally indoctrinated to shout for Jesus, but say nothing about the injustices that Jesus detested and died for. We preach Marcus Jesus, but we don't always preach what pr Jesus preached. We acknowledge Jesus as Savior, but we seem to have forgotten what he truly saved us from. We celebrate his person and his providence, but we are oftentimes reluctant in exclaiming his true teachings that were both prophetic and pastoral, merciful and missional. And I, again, contend it 
benefits, all a result of being culturally indoctrinated by a world that wants us to advance Eurocentric ideology and colonialism cloaked as capitalism as opposed to liberative and transformative theology, which is the undergirding of true kingdom-like practices in living. You see, it was Eurocentric theologians and evangelical televangelists as co-conspirators with both liberal and conservative non-theocratic policy makers who sanctioned most of the ills of the ages. They sought to justify slavery through bigoted and biased biblical interpretation. They set out still to silence those voices that are seeking justice as they did during the civil rights age and era by condemning and charging them as being civilly disobedient and heretics. Uh, and even now by the stretching and searching of scripture to support their justification uh, of exalting and standing alongside of insurrectionists uh, and terrorists uh, and daring to equate their acts as that of free speech uh, while indicting Black Lives Matter of freedom fighters as criminals. I'm talking about those who characterize Kamala, our sister Vice President Kamala Harris as a Jezebel, but still consider Trump as possessing Jesus-like qualities. Those who proclaim that blue lives matter, but yet bludgeon them to death on the Capitol steps and hallways and corridors, uh, which causes us to consider blue lives seemingly only matter when they choose to defend them after they have taken uh, the innocent life of a black man or woman. Yes. Eurocentric theologians and evangelical televangelists have sanctioned our agony while the miseducated Negro now in the church and preacher as well have become culturally indoctrinated by their schools and their television networks as a means to soothe their pain with empty religious platitudes and the romanticism of a so-called post-racial society. Yes, the miseducation of the Negro in the Negro church is real, y'all, and it has real effects, so much so that it has even entered again and permeated the call and the motivation of the Lord's church. The miseducation of the Negro in Negro church, or, or excuse me, the African American and the black church is what chose Rome over Nazareth and a politician in 2008 or over a prophet named Jeremiah. For we live and we serve in an age and an era of such mainstream ministry that causes some to desire mega, yes, and major without being meaningful, missional, and messianic. There's a word I'm heading somewhere as the Lord leads me. But on this day, we are here to experience a sankofa moment in our hearing that will save us and pick us up from where we have been left off or left behind. For the Bible reveals and reports that Jesus, y'all, entered the synagogue, the synagogue where ancient and now modern Jews gather for worship and religious instruction. Worship unto the God of their deliverance and instruction on what Jerome Clayton Ross identified as the seven keys of survival. After all, they were minority people struggling to survive and thrive in the midst of mad kings and those who were leaving imperial and autocratic nations. Jesus entered this synagogue as was his custom after exiting the wilderness. And if I could park there for a moment, I feel it now that the Lord still demands and requires of us when we are able and privileged to do so to make our way to the temple in spite of all of the chaos and the turbulence that we experience day by day in other places and spaces that we occupy, that there is still something to be said about holy and Counters and holy places. He entered the synagogue. And it should be noted that both the world of Jesus and the world of second Isaiah that he reads from were subject, both of them, to bondage. 
Yet Jesus and Isaiah refused to be defined or bound by it. Thusly, the spirit of the Lord is upon me declaration was one of protest for the purpose of self-actualization, preservation, and protection. And you notice how Jesus here goes backwards, however, Sankofa, in order to move forward. He turns back the scrolls and he turns back to the prophet of old. He takes a look back over his life and the experience of his people. He has and experiences a Sankofa moment. Jesus, like Paul, was taught in a synagogue, but now he goes back to re-educate the miseducated. Jesus established a nexus between remembrance and relevancy. For the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and you heard me read it, and Isaiah declared, and now Jesus on that day proclaims that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Robert Dykstra once stated and said in some of his penmanship in one publication that the preacher ought not to talk about him or herself unless they use a personal parabolic statement but Jesus went ahead and chose to talk about himself and said that the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he reinforms or re-educates the miseducated community of faith as the Lord is speaking unto us in our hearing today. But the question is, and I won't be long, what's the lesson that we are in need of learning during this Heritage Month, during this Sankofa Sunday experience. Lessons that, yes, your pastor teach daily, but what are we being challenged, called to be reminded of right now at this hour? The principles and the precepts, precepts that speak to and lead us into the practice, full practice of our faith. Well, just a few lessons. First lesson is, that prophetic witnessing and truly divine truth-telling. They're the primary mode and mechanism of expressing and exercising the ministry of Jesus. Jesus talked in a manner and a way that it was not intended for people to be made to feel comfortable. Jesus talked the talk, told the truth unapologetically. And we need to learn how to witness more prophetically. It was the early 20th century writer and humorist Finley Peter Dunn or Doon who defined the role of the newspaper, what we have since adopted as our operative definition of prophetic preaching, and that is it is intended to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfort. <coughs> and I recall Professor Bork and Sanders of the School of Theology stating that prophetic speaking or witnessing is a form of speech that seeks to arrest drifting societies, reconnecting them to their charter meanings. Prophetic speaking, witnessing, and preaching is, as he says, roots speech. It takes us back to a good place before being tainted and influenced by colonialism. Jesus speaks to the condition of existence brought on by systemic sins formed in institutions and the legislation of Roman, the Roman Senate and executive orders of Caesar's Augustus and executed by Pontius Pilate, just like the times that we have just recently faced. Legislation and orders that subjugated one people while exalting the other. Such Roman rule was even being regulated by religious leaders, however, who as retainers were benefiting from their own people's brokenness. But Jesus doesn't tweet, but utters these words. He proclaims that the Lord has anointed me and I have been sent to preach good news 
to the poor. That's prophetically witnessing as it afflicts, yes, the comfortable. The poor are those who labored in an agrarian economy and were taxed up to 70% without representation or reparations. The poor were those who were infirm but could not afford uh, uh, the importation of that bomb from Gilead. The poor were those from the borders of society who faithfully followed Christ but still could not afford to feed their famished families. We, we need to preach and witness not just hope but good news to the poor that because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and that he owns a cattle and a thousand hills and because we have uh, brought our tithe yes and our often to the storehouse we not only have meat to eat but there's room for all of God's people the poor and the disadvantaged and disenfranchised room for them at the table talking about the poor and the forgotten. But this message is not being heard by the poor only, but those in positions of power as well who created the climate of indebtedness and perpetuated practices of plunder that forever kept and still forever keep the poor among us. Jesus is preaching and speaking and witnessing prophetically to those who are in the house, not the magistrates, not the Senate or the assemblies or the patrician families, but the Pharisees or the precursors to rabbis, the elders, the priests, the, the, the priests, the scribes, if you will, the church folk. Jesus is preaching to the religious elite. And we must preach and we must witness and we must live out the life as Jesus did and as Jesus preached to both the White House and our very own houses of both faith and family. Like the Isaiah read in your hearing and the soon to be collapse of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, Jesus preaches with conviction that due to such sins, Rome will soon crumble and collapse as well. Then Jesus said, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner. The political, political prisoner, those whose freedoms have been compromised because they freely spoke truth to power, such prisoners as Barabbas, whom Jesus would later trade places with on the cross. Again, that's the other binary purpose of prophetic witnessing, teaching, preaching, and testifying. As unto the poor, he comforted the afflicted, but now he afflicts the comfortable. Prisoners are held against their will for crimes committed against the law of the land, whether guilty or innocent. They're held captive in chains. Jesus shows compassion, however, and clemency towards such prisoners who had been falsely accused of made into criminals due to a corrupt and unjust legal system. I'm talking about a system that has built a school, the prison pipeline. We know that one that bails bad cops out for killing black and brown bodies. Corrupt. But can I push you just a little further? And the shout will be there. Hear this now, this proclaiming freedom for the prisoner is not only for the prisoner who, like the poor, is not in the synagogue, but those who are in the synagogue who have the proclivity to police and imprison those who push toward progress. From Nat Turner and Fannie Lou to Colin Kaepernick and Alexandria Cortez. Cortez. Yes, we too have jailers and wardens and correctional officers in some communities of Christ that dare to handcuff the prophetic and progressive pulpit in the name of decorum. For such prophetic witnessing is not just the tone or the tenor of preaching during the age that we still find ourselves in, this so-called Trump age but even needed in the churches again that we serve in and that we are committed to and connected to where there are Trump-like tendencies practice every single day when we canonize xenophobia and misogyny. That's a Trump-like tendency. But lastly, we not only learn that prophetic witnessing and teaching and preaching and speaking is the primary mode and mechanism of expressing Marcus the ministry of Jesus, but embracing and exercising our missional mandate is the evidence our, of our hearing of a prophetic witness. Jesus moves, if you will, from word to work, from internal to external witnessing. 
I'm talking about the going forth and recovering or picking up of folk that we left behind in certain customs and traditions that kept us as a people in our yesteryear. I'm talking about that which deseg desegrega desegregation and the catechism of integration or cultural indoctrination kept us from and took from us. Jesus teaches us what we need to do now that we've heard what the Lord had to say. Because in our pursuit again to uh, obtain a piece of the American pie, a pie that our grandmothers and ancestors did not bake and perhaps couldn't even stomach, we lost out and we let go and we sacrificed some stuff that kept Grandmama Madeira and all of them. And unfortunately, in our pursuit for uh, success and our pursuit for upper uh, mobility, we have even left some of our kinfolk and cousins behind. But Jesus declares that God has sent him to recover the sight for the blind and to set the oppressors free. That's our mandate. Sight that had been lost, but Jesus recovers such sight. Uh, some of our brothers and our sisters have lost their way due to their perception being compromised by a dominant and blinding culture. But as the body of Christ, we have been called and anointed and commissioned uh, to open blinded eyes by not only loving but showing mercy. Showing up in the dark places we left and left some folk behind is the opening of bl blinded eyes. The eyes of those who never left and those of us who left too soon. And after the lesson, the Bible says Jesus rolled up the scroll, closed the book, if you will, gave it back to the attendant, the worship leader, and he sat down. Therese, the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. They heard him, but now they are watching him. So he says to them, today the scripture is fulfilled, my beloved, in your hearing. Today it is carried into effect, brought to realization, performed, executed, and realized. Unlike his contemporaries who were self-medicating themselves with a theology of hope alone, Jesus introduces unto us in this text the doctrine of realized eschatology, as in today you will be with me in paradise. Oh, the time for justice and freedom is now. The genius of Jesus is that although the world walked away from him, after waiting on him, he tells the world to make it happen today. Today is a contravening moment to the reality you were once experiencing. It is in the space where it appears to be your most negative experience that grace happens and paradise is made visible. Today doesn't wait for Caesar subsidies, but today is a new form of existence as we reclaim the prosperity we once had prior to integrating with Egypt, Babylon, and Rome. That's why we can declare that this is the day that the Lord has made, and we ought to rejoice and be made glad in it, because Jesus says today, what I preached and what I've shared with you, it shall be realized, it shall be performed, it shall be carried out. And I believe that the reason why, unfortunately, many of us uh, have yet to experience our today or we choose not to be today type of believers, because the scripture ultimately reveals that once you start talking about change and making such change in the name of justice, you will then have a mark on your back that your antagonist will seek to annihilate you and silence you and take you out. But I say today, this scripture is fulfilled, New Calvary. Before today, all we had was hope, but today we have this anointing and power to set at liberty the captives. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon all of us. It is upon New Calvary. It is upon not only the uh, pulpit, but the pew. It is upon us, not the king, but the prophet. Uh, not Pharaoh as believed in ancient Egyptian times or Caesar in the days of Rome, but it's upon the people of God because we are the theocracy. We are those whom the Lord has called out from and anointed to do such work. Jesus 
takes us back, I tell you, to a place where we first believed. He takes us back to a place where we had power, where we were endowed with such power to move mountains and even strike rocks and cause water to cry from it. When Babylon fell and Israel was freed, he takes us back where our ancestors rest and heaven resides. Postmodernity has caused us to question and trash our authority, including some of that which was actually for our good pre-integration. But Jesus Jesus corrects the miseducation of the Negro church. He corrects it and reminds us that sometimes, again, you need to go back and pick up some of that stuff that we have chosen to sell out in order to be seated alongside of folk that do, do not love our humanity. Sometimes you have to go back in order to move forward. Sometimes, like many Ripperton, you have to go back down memory lane. And Gladys even said, you have to go back to find a simpler place and time. And you have to do as Isaac Watts declared at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. And the burdens of my heart rolled away. All I'm trying to say is, at some point in time, we have to be willing to experience a Sankofa moment. Why would you ask? Because I declare that there's salvation in going back. Something can be said about those Sankofa experiences in that it was there that you met up with the salvific power of the Lord. Jesus, I tell you, returned himself to Nazareth. You know, he went back to Nazareth, and then he even turned back or went back to the prophecy of Isaiah in order to re-educate the miseducated people of God of their forgotten purpose and power. And then going back when he picked up some folk, he picked up the poor in the text and the imprisoned. He picked up the blind, and he picked up the oppressed. My beloved, every now and again, you have to be willing to go back or experience a Sankofa moment in order to fully move forward in the power of the God that we serve. There's no secret, you know it, I'm from the country. I'm a country boy and I shared a few years ago of how I recall on one occasion how I discovered the significance of Sankofa, discovered the significance of going back, if you will, in order to move forward better than before. You see, back in high school, Back in the late 80s, Marcus, I was blessed to purchase or buy a Volkswagen Rabbit. It was a four-speed, didn't pay but $100 for it. It was a little rusty at the, at the bottom of its frame, but the engine worked and, and the transmission was holding itself together. Yeah, I'll tell you, it was a four-speed, you know, and I would get in that uh, Volkswagen Rabbit and, and make my way to my desired destination, moving from first to second and third and fourth. It wasn't a five-speed nor three-speed, but it was a four-speed. And it also had another gear, however, somewhere up there in the upper left-hand corner of uh, the stick shift or the drive shaft. It had another gear that did not have a one, two, or three uh, a numerical value upon it, but it had a letter on it. It had the letter R, y'all. Uh, and that aura represented, if you will, reverse. In other words, after you've gone your way ahead of yourself, and if by chance you've gone a little too far, or you've discovered that you needed to turn back, you could put it in reverse. And on this one occasion, I recalled on my way to school one morning, on my way making that 20 minute drive from Molis to Lancaster, to my high school there, I, I passed I passed on by a hitchhiker. I passed on by a brother who was down at the bottom of the hill uh, trying to make his way somewhere. I remember it vividly, y'all. Uh, I passed the brother on by in my 1979 green Volkswagen Rabbit. It was, again, a four-speed. Uh, I passed him on by. You know, hitchhiking wasn't so serious back then. Prior to us coming to the knowledge of 
have unfortunately still today that which plagues us in, tra in sex trafficking God. but on that day I just simply passed him on by because I was busy I passed him on by because my mind was made up I had to make it before the bell rung at 8 a.m. on that morning I passed him on by because I didn't know him really but I seen him before and he wasn't my kinfolk or from the same pedigree or, or family tree so I passed him on by but something grabbed hold of my consciousness something grabbed hold of my heart and I looked up in my rear view mirror and I remember seeing that brother back there after I have gone some 40 or 50 yards and I was convicted in that moment because I remember before I had the Volkswagen before I had that four speed before I had that 79 rabbit that I had to wait just like he waited on the corner after school in order for someone's kind and gracious enough didn't mind being interrupted stopping by and picking us up and dropping us off at the bottom of the hill I remembered what it was like on a cold and chilly afternoon longing to have a ride uh, but having to wait until somebody finally uh, was willing to stop by and pick us up uh, and I learned something in that moment uh, God convicts you y'all uh, to go back sometimes uh, in order to pick some folk up uh, that you left behind uh, so I hit my brakes uh, and I put that old 1979 Volkswagen rabbit uh, in reverse uh, and with a wine transmission uh, with a winding transmission y'all uh, I put it in reverse uh, and I backed all the way up uh, and pulled aside the brother uh, opened my door uh, and asked him if he needed a ride uh, and where can I drop him off at uh, he talked to me and I talked to him uh, and when we got to the next town uh, he said this is good my brother uh, thank you for the ride gave me two or three dollars back then that was a half a tank of gas he gave me a few dollars that I didn't have on my own he blessed me because I blessed him but what am I trying to say all I did y'all is did what Jesus did and that is put it in reverse after 40 and two generations he put it in reverse on a hill called Calvary he put it in reverse in a chilly tomb and a catacomb on a Sunday morning. He put it in reverse. And one of these old days, he says, I'm going to put it in reverse. Come back and gather the elite. I don't know about you, but I'm Jesus type convicted. If I have failed you, I'm going to put it in reverse. If I left you behind to a failing democracy, Say, uh, I'm going to put it in reverse and uh, pick you up uh, the way he picked me up. Uh, and aren't you mighty glad uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is willing to go back uh, and go down uh, in order to pick you up? Uh, I thank you, Jesus, uh, for going back, uh, meeting me uh, where I was. Uh, Thank you, Jesus, uh, for revisiting me uh, where I chose to be left off. Uh, thank you, Jesus, uh, for showing up uh, after folk walked out. Uh, won't he will uh, keep showing up? Uh, won't he will uh, go back to check on you? Uh, won't he will uh, put it in reverse? Uh, won't he will uh, reach way down uh, to pick you up? Uh, can I say it like I feel it? Uh, so if you've been left behind be not dismayed will ever be tired God will God will take care of you by going back picking you up lifting you up exalting you saving you pony wheel say yes he will Put it in reverse. It'll go all the way back if necessary. In, the, in order to pick those of us up 
who have been left behind. That's what he does, and that's what we ought to do. See, the miseducation of the Negro in the Negro church is that we become so culturally indoctrinated to the ways of this world that we forgot the mandate. It's not just simply each of us choosing to do, yes, what God will have us to do, and that is to prosper and be in good health. He has come so that we may have life and have it more abundantly. But for the rest of them, just as it was for us, perhaps, we have to be willing to put it in reverse. San Kofa, go back. That's where the salvation is. I don't know about you, but to be left behind, and yet someone comes back to get you, is a salvific experience. San Kofa is salvation. And the Lord commissions us to practice it. Not just reflecting in theory, but doing in such practice of a life of justice and equity and equality. And yes, making or causing your transmission to whine a little bit, to strain a little bit. You don't want to go, but you got to go. Because when you look back over your life, when you look into your rear view mirror, I'm talking about those of us who let some folk behind. When you look back over your life and just think things over, you can clearly see that the Lord has been good to you. The Lord showed up in somebody else to pick you up after other folk, including our own selves, left ourselves behind. I'm done, that's all I have. I don't know about anybody, I'm just grateful <laughs> that he being created in the same image of God or in the image of God, co-equal to God, caught, thought it not robbery, not just simply to humble himself, but to go back. He who reigns and finds residence in that place of pure Godhead said, I'm going back. Pick some folk up. I'm going back to help the blind and the poor and the oppressed and the imprisoned. I'm going back to get those folk that Rome has exploited and left behind. He has come, and y'all know how it is in our faith. We shout over the fact that he's coming again. God, we thank you for putting it in reverse. You who is the creator, the architect of heaven and earth, you chose that still in the experience of Jesus, we call Christ, to come back unto us and show us a new route, a new way more importantly, to recover us, to restore us, to redeem us, to deliver us. God, we thank you. Now help us to do such work that has been done for us. Help us as the body of Christ to be willing, oh God, to strain our transmissions, to strain our perceptions and prejudices so that we can help somebody along the way someone who did not ask to be left behind but is waiting there on the byway or the highway or the sidelines even the ditches and the curves of life have us to go back and pick them up San for your salvation. Bless this body of Christ and this blessed brother in Christ who serves you faithfully with preaching power, teaching power, and Holy Ghost power. 
to lead us ahead by every now and again taking us back to the place where we first believed. God, this is our prayer. We ask it all on this day. In the name of Mary's baby, the bright and morning star, the rose of Sharon, that root cut from dry ground. We ask it all in the name of Jesus, the love of our soul, and we say, Amen. Amen. your hearts up, your likes up, and just show your appreciation for this preacher. We extend this moment, this invitation to discipleship. Maybe somebody uh, who is watching in this moment desires to become a part of the New Calvary Baptist Church. If that is your desire, again, we give you the number 757-828-6121. 757-828-6121. Eight two eight six one two one. You can call uh, to be a part, and somebody will answer and go through the process with you and make sure that you are on your way to be a member of New Calvary. You can put that in the comment section. Uh, you can call the church at seven five seven six two seven one two six nine as we continue to grow and share together. We have been blessed this morning, beloved. We have been blessed by this awesome man of God. And so we extend this moment, maybe somebody under the sound of my voice, somebody who needs to be a part, somebody who's never been a part of the fellowship of the faithful, we say in this moment, give you the opportunity to say, God, I need you. God, I've, uh, I've decided to follow you. I've decided to open my heart to you and your possibility. Continue to speak and lead as only you can, God, and in all things I will follow. Give me the strength to turn it all over to you. I've been doing it by myself for too long. And I know, God, that I need a Savior. So, God, we are excited. There are those who rejoice with you, and we continue to pray for you. And so, God, as I turn this life over to you, show me where to step, show me where to go, show me how to live. And God, I promise I'll give you praise, honor, and glory. And I'll do it in the wonderful name of Jesus. We say amen and amen. We are excited for you in this moment as you share in this moment with God. I declare this fella knows how to tell the story. Amen, amen. We were blessed this morning. And so we are grateful for all of you. We want to just let you know uh, that we are continuing uh, to share Monday our prayer call, 8 a.m. Please get on our prayer call and share with us as we love to share with you and enter in and bring in the week uh, with a word of prayer and a word of reflection. On Wednesday at 7 p.m., we will continue uh, to deal with our spiritual formation as we go forward and as we continue to grow and to tr in our Bible study at 7 p.m. on Facebook Live. So we look to see you there. We have this benediction, this benediction that was put together as a result of some African prayers that we came across. It goes like this. May God set you free. May God guard you night and day. May God set you in the right place. May God give you good health both in mind, in your body, and in your spirit. May you be reminded, whether in the darkness or in the light, that the grace of God is with you. May God's power elevate you to grow into greater things. May God's togetherness guide us and help us to bring peace and understanding to protect the world. And we believe together that this is so. And together, the people of God say, I say, and amen. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Until then, take care of yourself and each other. Be good. Peace.